Thank you, Senator Macdonald. It being uh, just past 5 p.m. pursuant to order, I call Senator Hinch to make his first speech and remind senators of the courtesy we extend to senators giving their first speech. Senator Hinch. <clears throat> Mr. President and uh, fellow senators, good evening and thank you for attending my first speech. I am humbled and I'm honoured, even a bit uh, pinch me gobsmacked to be standing here as an elected representative of the people of Victoria. Being privately given my Senator number 576 security pin and symbolic gold pass by Rachel Callanan, the Usher of the Black Rod, it touched me and it moved me more than I could have ever known or ever dreamed. Senator Hinch, last, night, last year it was not on my agenda or my, my bucket list. A year ago, he just formed a political party. Hinch, a politician, give me a break. He's been fighting with pollies and prime ministers for years, for decades. But it is truly a great honour in any Australian's life and a challenge, a big challenge to be chosen by the Australian people to represent them in this august National Assembly, this Chamber of Democracy. And it brings with it an awesome responsibility. I am now, as you all know, one of only 580 people who have held that title, ever. That is hundreds less than have worn the baggy green or played VFL or AFL football. Reportedly, I am in the record books as being the oldest person ever elected to the Australian Senate. So I guess I'll be enshrined as a trivial pursuit question. <laughs> and when that fact was made public, somebody tweeted, there should be an age limit in the Senate. And I tweeted back, I agree 100 per cent. What minimum age do you suggest? <laughs> now, jokes aside, I don't take the task lightly. I do believe I'm in a unique position. I've met every Australian Prime Minister since Robert Menzies. I met Ming in 1964. I've interviewed most Prime Ministers since then, from Harold Holt on, and I didn't vote for any of them. I didn't vote against them because I still think compulsory voting is wrong. I think it's undemocratic and I will campaign against it while I'm here. I also still believe that media commentators should be exempt from voting. They should not vote, or if they do, they should tell you how they vote. You can be granted exemption, you may not know, on religious grounds, so why not on moral grounds or philosophical grounds or occupational grounds? Now, I've been accused of hypocrisy for voting for the first time on July the, two, July the 2nd. Well, I'm no longer a journalist. And I did point out I'd waited a lifetime to find somebody worth voting for. But <laughs> that is a joke choice. I also think it's an appalling situation in this IT age when one month after a federal election, the results still weren't officially known, not to mention the census debacle. And surely something is rotten in the state of Denmark, as they say, when all of us here in this Senate today started getting a taxpayer-funded paycheck from July the 1st, when we didn't even sit for one day in this chamber for the next two months, and we'll barely sit again until Christmas. Now, speaking of what happens and doesn't happen here in the Senate, I also think it's wrong there are so many media restrictions on when and how we can be filmed or photographed in this chamber. It is wrong that a Senate can only be photographed when he or she is on their feet and has the call. This is the People's House of Review. The media should be able to see us in action or inaction. And if you get caught, if you get caught nibbling your earwax or counting your money or dozing, now that's tough. I was fair game when I got caught with eyes closed during the Governor General's boring recital of Malcolm Turnbull's speech. So I will introduce a motion to try to change this and we'll join a press gallery high court bid if necessary to allow the same freedoms here for media photographers as they have in the lower house. Now, my ambition in this house is to do my best for the people who elected me. I know all politicians, you all say that, we all say that. I'll call things as I see them, my career supports that. People ask me how come I get sacked so often. At last count, I've been fired 16 times. And I say, well, they hire me for who I am and what I say, and then they fire me for who I am and what I say. And the people of Australia, of Victoria, have just hired me. And if they don't like it, they're entitled to fire me. It looks like it will be three years. It should be six, as you know, under S282, which was brought in by Prime Minister Bob Hawke because he thought it was a fair call. And a six-year term for me and the Greens, Senator Rhiannon, in New South Wales. That was one of the recommendations from the Australian uh, Electoral Commission when they returned the writs on August the 8th. The electoral uh, pendulum inventor, Malcolm McCarris, he agrees with that. But you big boys got together, surprise, surprise, and what the Liberals and the Greens started in 2016 with that unholy alliance to destroy the minor parties, the government and Labor continued with your minor party stitch up in this chamber. 
It was a Senate decision, it was not a constitutional one, and self-preservation prevails. But at least I got the first division vote, even though I lost it. Anyway, I've said, as leader of Derrida's Justice Party, I'll try to be an unpolitical politician, a common sense politician. I won't be PC, I won't be politically correct. But that's why I say from the outset, although I have hopes, high hopes, of achieving good things, I've seen other people come here with high hopes and great dreams and stumble and crumble. An Australian icon, Peter Garrett, a man of principle who came here cloaked in great ideas and ideals, many idlessly ingrained in him from the lyrics of Midnight Oil. He left broken and disillusioned and com compromised, unfairly shackled to a Labor government's fatally reckless pink band scandal which cost four young lives. Neville Rand, the former New South Wales Labor Premier and Labor Party President, once admitted over a bottle of confessional Chardonnay that by the time you get to the top, you're covered in so much blood and muck from the deals you made on the way up, you forget what drove you, what inspired you into seeking public office in the first place. Well, I'm not a horse trainer, I'm not a wheeler, I'm not a dealer. I spent half a century as a journalist trying to keep the bastards honest and having the title senator, having that in front of my name, my name won't change that. In fact, it might make it easier to name names without having to wear an ankle bracelet or go to jail again or be under house arrest again, trying to protect children. Now, it has been speculated that I will use parliamentary privilege to name names under the protection of what is derided as Coward's Castle. And I will. But it will be a court of last resort. I will not be a cowboy. But if it is necessary to protect a child's well-being, then damn right, I'll name the human vermin, and I will tonight. Like a Canberra degenerate whose semen was found on the nappy of a two-year-old girl and his mother was babysitting her at the time. The Canberra Times did not name him, but he is Juan Carlos Cruz. And for this disgusting crime, almost incomprehensible to normal people, he was sentenced in Canberra to only three years and three months imprisonment, with a non-parole period of 20 months. 20 bleeping months, and that is a sick judicial joke. The offender was born in El Salvador, and if he's not an Australian citizen, I believe he should be deported the minute he finishes his paltry sentence. Juan Carlos Cruz continues to deny the offences. The judge said he showed no indication of remorse, contrition or acceptance of responsibility. So I would say deport the scumbag. Then there are the two Victorian degenerates whom I named on the steps of Parliament House and then because of it spent five months under house arrest and lost my job at 3AW. The Armadale rapist, Mark Jewell and Gordon Taylor. And how about that evil creature, Brian Keith Jones, nicknamed Mr Baldy, because he kidnapped young boys and shaved their heads and painted them with lipstick and dressed them in girls' clothes. And recently, he had his name suppressed again, and he's walking our streets again. And you have to say, why? You have a right to know who he is, what he looks like, and more importantly, where he is. Now, on a brighter note, recently I went to holiday in Hawaii, and I paid, the taxpayer didn't, and I watched the US presidential election conventions on TV. I've seen a lot of them. I actually went to a few of them as a foreign correspondent in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, they tell you every four years how they're going to make America great again. Jesus wept. I've been hearing that since JFK in 1960. Yes, we can. Because no, I can't. Well, sorry, we didn't. But we also hear the same thing here every three years. Visions, dreams, promises, slogans, jobs and growth. Never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Etc. 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 as Yoel Brynner once said. It's bullshit. I spent months on the 2016 election campaign. We covered 11,250 kilometres in the justice bus. And I can say to you, you know what? Both major parties were so on the nose this time. You know why so many of our small party senators got elected? Because, as Peter Finch said in the movie Network, Pauline, I'm fed up and I'm not going to take it anymore. And the voters didn't, and they won't, next time either. Now, I've been chastised for using this expression, so this will be the last time I ever do. I called the campaign the Shakespearean election. 
a pox on both your houses. But it's right. And if you Liberals think that the superannuation issue and feared respect, uh, retrospectivity did not affect your primary vote, especially here in the upper house, oh, tell them they're dreaming. Now, this may seem sort of out of kilter tonight, but if you bear with me, I want to go back to my days, as I, I think is what you do in first speeches, as my days as a teenager in a small town across the ditch in New Zealand. And I remember, as an impressionable kid, reading about the Project Mercury astronauts and the Americans' amazing plans for space exploration. This was even before President Kennedy's incredible promise to the world that the United States, before this decade is out, to land men on the moon and return them safely to Earth. And this was 1959. Now you wonder, I wonder, how could a scrawny kid, me, living in a small town in a small country, at the arse end of the world, as Paul Keating used to call it, even conceive that before the decade was out, I'd be at Cape Canaveral watching Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins blast off to the moon, standing within metres of the Apollo 11 astronauts. Now I've been lucky. I once told a boss at Fairfax that you make your own luck. But I have been lucky to stand and have a seat on the Isle of History, watching those men go to the moon. I've covered political tragedies like the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy Jr. And thanks to the generosity of 3AW listeners in Melbourne, we chartered a plane and took $400,000 worth of high-protein food and blankets and cooking oil to Ethiopia during the famine and saw 25,000 refugees, virtually all of whom would die in a starvation camp on the outskirts of Alamata. And I stood in the desert alongside an incredibly, incredible Australian medico, Dr Tony Atkins. In front of us, sitting in the dust, were starving mothers, fathers and their children. And even there, even there in the midst of poverty and the famine and the suffering and the disease, families there had each laid out a tattered blanket anchored on the corners with stones and saw the last desperate attempt at a patch of family turf. And each morning, the mothers would shuffle up to the stall where Dr Atkins had an ancient set of greengrocer's scales. And their baby would be placed on the scales. And if they reached a meagre weight, they were ticked for food and for medicine. But if they literally failed to make the weight, they were turned away. They were too far gone, with only enough supplies for the, the savable, and that tragic system of the human lifeboat, the triage system, kicked in in the middle of a desert in Africa. And I thought that playing God for those mothers and their babies would lead Atkins to a nervous breakdown. I often wondered what happened to him. Coincidentally, in the election, it brought us together. Our paths crossed for the first time in more than 30 years at the Berwick Market one Sunday morning. And speaking of life and death, I want to talk about organ transplants and organ donations. Without a donated liver, I wouldn't be here. And to be blunt, my funeral would have been held five years ago. That's why I want to help trigger the signing up of one million more organ donors in Australia, activating and promoting the government's new app to make it easy to sign a living will, which means a donor commitment that no family member can overturn. And imagine a million more donors in a country where our donor population to population ratio is abysmal compared to other Western countries. Now, for a while in my book, A Human Headline, Human Deadline, sorry, I advocated strongly for the opt-out system rather than the current opt-in system. Under opt-out, like they have in Spain, everybody's considered to be a potential donor unless you just opt out. You sign a register saying you don't want to be an organ donor for cultural, ethnic, religion reasons, or no reason, just any reason. You just don't do it. The downside of opt-out is that people depict the government as body snatchers, like it's my body, how dare they, they are ghouls. Now, opt-in is where you sign the register as a willing organ donor, but the weakness there, and not many people know this, is that signing up doesn't guarantee that your organs will be considered for transplant. Your loved ones can overrule you, overrule that wonderful decision. And they do. And of course, you'll never know. And it happens in more than 40% of cases. Now, families, in understandable grief, they can't or won't make the decision to donate. And that means that healthy, life-saving organs are thrown into hospital rubbish bins. And then they get burnt. Now, I know it's totally understandable. Can you imagine? I've seen this. A young mother waves her nine-year-old daughter off to school, off to primary school, and because of some ghastly accident, she's now standing in a hospital's intensive care unit, 12 hours later, being told that life support is being turned off 
and will you donate your daughter's organs? Now, there's a compromise between opt-out and opt-in, which I call opt-in plus. It wouldn't alleviate that example, but it would guarantee a living will clause, which I hope you'll consider, where if you're on the donor list and your wishes in death would be honoured. And this version is now being successfully used in five or six states in the United States. Now, I do have a vested interest, obviously. I mean, I'm possibly the first senator with an organ transplant. I'm not sure. So just a little bit of background. Six years ago, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer and given, at most, 12 months to live. Primary cancer of the liver. I have held my old liver in my hand. I've met the family of my donor, Heath Gardner, his mother, Linda, his father, Trevor, his sisters, Kimberly and Melanie. And I want to dwell on this because being an organ donor is so important. You can save not only one life, you can save five lives, you can save six lives. And Heath Gardner saved mine. And I said to the pathologist, Peter Crowley, I said, do you see many as bad as this? And he said, usually in autopsies. And I said, well, how long do you think I had? And he said, well, now I've got it out and you look at it, I reckon about two weeks. As Elton John would say, I'm still standing. So thanks to the Gardner family, the skills of Professor Bob Jones, his team, the brave research of a man called Professor Thomas Stalzel, the American doctor, the professor, who invented liver transplants 50 years ago. And I stand here today, because of that, in a unique position to try to help save thousands more lives. And a year after the transplant, when given permission to fly again, I went to my beloved New York, the metropolis that I thought I'd never see again. I farewelled it a few months before I, before I had the operation. When I went back, I took a side trip to Pittsburgh to thank Professor Stasel, the man who, who, who invented liver transplants. And when I got back to Manhattan, after a meeting, I received an email from the doctor, which at first seemed strange because it started out, Darren, it was an honour to meet you. And I thought, surely it was the other way around. But then I read the rest of it, and it can still bring tears to my eyes because the man who invented liver transplants and saw his first seven transplant patients die and was ridiculed by his so-called peers as a medical cowboy, he wrote, Darren, I can't tell you how warmed I was to see firsthand in you the distant ripple of the silly dream that I first had more than half a century ago. So thank you, Thomas Starzl and Heath Gardner. And also thank you, my paternal grandmother, Sarah Elizabeth Hinch, for some sage advice I tried to live by when told I had cancer and was going to die. She used to say about life, and she lived to 96, she used to say that it's not what happens to you in life that matters, it's how you handle it. And I hope I handled that death sentence, that diagnosed death sentence, in a way which would have made her proud. Hope some acts of kindness since then, and this new career in public service, will show that I've tried to use these bonus years well, if not always wisely. On another issue of life and death, this is dying with dignity, the cause of voluntary euthanasia. It's been one I've championed for decades. When my mother was dying of terminal lung cancer 26 years ago, I sat at her bedside alone with her on her final night. She had no dignity. She had no quality of life. She was lying there semi-comatose incontinent, a pillow stuffed between her legs, starving like one of those Ethiopians I'd seen, dying but not with one shred of dignity. And I've said, if she had been a dog and an RSPCA inspector had walked into that room that night, I would have been charged with cruelty to animals. And what the Howard government did to overturn the Northern Territory legislation and the relentless campaign to thwart Philip Nitschke was, I believe, in, and it was then, is now, inhumane religious bigotry. And I hope this parliament will reflect the will of 75 per cent of the Australian people and pass dying with dignity legislation, or at least let individual states do it. For starters, I want to scrap what's dubbed the Andrews Bill, the federal block on the Northern Territory, the ACT in Norfolk Island. And then we can move towards dying with dignity legislation, like the one proposed in Victoria after that state's rational upper house inquiry. I do stand here today hoping to rewrite or scrap some old laws and bring in some new ones. On the outside, I managed to change a couple. For example, this year at midnight on the Wednesday before the federal election, the advertising blackout kicked in. The Libs were like that. At least it stopped Labor's scurrilous, deceitful Mediscare commercials. Now, until I campaigned to get the electoral blackout laws changed back in the 80s, 70s, 
Not only were political ads banned, but so were all political news stories and comments on radio and television. It was still open slather for newspapers. Hard to believe, isn't it? But for 48 hours, actually 66 hours to the close of the polls, all political news and comment was banned on electronic media. Not sure how they would have regulated Twitter or Facebook this time around because paid political party ads were still appearing on the internet after the ban kicked in this year. So all political news and comment was banned, like in some dictatorship. I used to speculate what would radio and TV have done if Harold Holt had gone missing off Portsea during a media blackout. They couldn't have legally reported it. And I still automatically answer every phone call just in case it is Harold Holt. Now, it was a bad law. I first broke it in the state election in 1979 by merely reading out loud on 3AW a story from the front page of The Australian. And then I defied it again at two federal elections and Prime Minister Bob Hawke finally scrapped a stupid, undemocratic law in late 1983. And I remember saying at the time, I was pleased my journalist colleagues were behind me. Just didn't realise how far behind me they were. And it was an anachronistic law, and I'm proud of changing it. Another one. I was convicted, fined and sentenced to 250 hours of community service for naming a judge in a rape and marriage case. The judge ruled in Victoria that a man could not be charged with raping his estranged wife under a 350-year-old British law. And the husband even walked free on a common assault charge. After the decision, the physically and emotionally injured victim, the wife, phoned me and to make it even worse, the judge had suppressed all evidence before the court. So I told the story on radio. I didn't name the alleged rapist. That would have identified his victim, because the wife still had her husband's name. I didn't even name the court. I thought that could possibly give a clue to her identity from court lists. But I did name the judge, Judge Frank Dyer. Because quite frankly, among other things, I thought his own wife should know what a Neanderthal she was married to. And anyway, I argued successfully, unsuccessfully that Judge Diet had only suppressed what was before the court. His name wasn't before the court, he was the court. I took him on and I lost, but a bad law was scrapped. I also went to jail for naming a pedophile priest, Michael Glennon, who was still running a camp for young kids at Lancefield in country Victoria, even though he had already spent a year in jail for the rape of a 10-year-old girl. Still ordained, Still assaulting children, you think, what a forgiving church, suffer little children. And I was called a cowboy, that word again, and even though I'd been to the Premier, the Attorney General, the Police Minister, and the hierarchy at the Catholic Church, and they all said, leave it to the courts. As it turned out, Father Glennon was still sexually assaulting children at that camp, at that time, and later was convicted and jailed for those new crimes, which was scant consolation for his victims. And maybe, if we'd had the public register of convicted sex offenders back then, and Glennon was on it for the rape of that little girl, maybe a parent would have not sent his or her child to that camp, or to Glennon's popular martial arts school for kids in Melbourne, or to the junior football team that he coached, providing an evil priest with even more victims. Now, this public register, which is so important to me, is what triggered the Darren Hitch's Justice Party. Because after I got out of jail the last time, after serving 50 days on contempt of court charges over that piece of excrement, Adrian Bailey, hundreds of people joined me for the Jail to Justice walk, a 10-day, 180-kilometre journey from Langy Calcal Prison to the steps of Victoria's Parliament House to present a multi-volume petition calling for a national public register of convicted sex offenders, convicted sex offenders. Like Megan's Law, named after seven-year-old Megan Kanker, who was stalked, raped and murdered by a convicted sex offender, who lived anonymously across the street from Megan and her parents, lived there with several other convicted sex offenders. The local police didn't even know their background. Now, I've talked to Megan's mum, Maureen, and one of her memories gives me a shiver would give any parent the shivers. It epitomises every parent's nightmare when they couldn't be there to protect the vulnerable, innocent child when they were needed the most. I guess Maureen Kanker wished at least that what happened to her daughter, to her little girl, was mercifully quick. Wished Megan was maybe unconscious and spared the pain, spared the horror. But then police told the mother 
how they got the confession from Megan's killer. They saw the scratch marks on his arm from a child's fingernails where Megan had fought so desperately and unsuccessfully for her young life. An image of her mother, Maureen Kanker, will carry to her grave. Now, Megan's law, which started as a state statute in New Jersey after Megan was raped and murdered, was signed into national law by President Clinton in 1996. That's 20 years ago. And that's why I say it's a travesty. It is a disgrace. It's incomprehensible to me that we do not have such a law in Australia. The public has a right to know. Parents trying to protect their vulnerable kids have a right to know. You have a right to know who's living next door to your family. And ask Shirley and Alan Irwin, maybe if their daughters, Colleen and Laura, had known that a convicted rapist lived across the street, they might still be alive. Ask George Halvegas. His daughter, Messina, was murdered while tending her grandmother's grave in Faulkner Cemetery, killed by Peter Dupas, a man who should not have been out of jail at the time. Senior police, very senior police, have told me that the current state registers, and whether your name even goes on there, is at the discretion of a judge or a magistrate. Senior police have told me that the current secret registers are unworkable, unenforceable. They are merely public relations exercises to make you, the public, feel good about them. And did you also know, almost all sex offenders on those lists, they self-report anyway, because the coppers don't have the time or the resources to check up on them. It is a sick joke. That's why I promise, I vow I won't give up until such a register as Megan's Law exists nationwide in Australia. And let's call it Daniel's Law, after Daniel Morecambe, who maybe would still be alive today if his killer, Brett Peter Cowan, had been sentenced to a real jail term years earlier for the abduction and rape of a seven-year-old boy from a Darwin caravan park whom he then left for dead in a burnt-out car. And if Brett Peter Cowan's name and photo and crimes had been listed on the public register, maybe Daniel's brave parents, Bruce and Denise, wouldn't have had to suffer for more than a decade of not knowing if their little boy was dead or alive. And maybe Jill Ma would still be alive today if serial rapist Adrian Bailey had been on the register. Or better still, if a magistrate had done his job and not released him on bail to appeal a piddling three-month jail sentence for knocking a man unconscious in Geelong at 2 a.m. when Bailey was on parole. Or if the parole board had done its job and listened to the sex crimes unit and listened to Bailey's own parents and revoked his parole because of well-founded fears, he would attack again. And he did. And the magistrate in Geelong, he must have felt the same way because one of the scumbag's bail conditions was he not visit the Geelong area for 12 months. So Bailey went to Coburg in Melbourne and went to Brunswick and Jill Ma died in an alley. And finally, on law and order issues. I wanted something tangible to end Australia's pedophile's involvement in the repugnant sex trade in Asia. In Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand and Myanmar, how can a convicted sex offender retain his passport to travel to Asia to buy children? They do. As actress Rachel Griffiths told me, she appealed to me for to help, she said, if a bankrupt could have his passport seized for seven years, why not a convicted pedophile? Good point. Now, in the Senate, I also promised to keep up my campaign to ban live exports. I'll admit it hasn't been very successful so far. The Greens will go along with that. During the election campaign, some Labor lackey accused me of jumping on the bandwagon. He called me a Johnny come lately. He said Labor, he tweeted, had been campaigning for a live export ban since 2012. Yeah, right. Actually, the ban was actually in 2011, was one of the achievements of the Gillard government. But the day the ban was announced, I went on 3AW, I opened my program some advice for the redoubtable Lynn White and her wonderful team at Animals Australia. And I said, don't start popping the champagne corks yet because Hinch's hunch, this ban will not last long. And it didn't. It lasted, what, six weeks? The goal will be even harder to, to reach now with the libs back in the saddle and Barnyard Barnaby as the farmer's friend, if not the cattle's protector. Another case of money before morality. And I know the libs done that. You, you, you love, you love live exports. Even when you see the gory proof of animals being sledgehammered to death in Vietnam, 
mere technicality. Remind you what Jenna Reinhardt's father, Lang Hancock, said when George Negus asked him 20, told him that 25 workers had died from cancer, from mesothelioma, from working in the asbestos mine at Wittenoon. And Lang Hancock said, that's the price you pay for progress. And as for jumping on the live bandwagon, I brought my first petition to Canberra, here in Canberra, urging the federal government to ban live exports in 1981. I handed the then Prime Minister, Minister Peter Nixon, a petition with 30,000 names on it. Now millions of Australians support a ban on live exports. Back then, we were protesting against the live export of horses to Japan and live sheep to the Middle East. That was 35 years ago. It was prompted by a maritime disaster in Fremantle, when more than, off Fremantle, when more than 10,000 sheep took up to four days to die in a fire aboard an overloaded multi-deck carrier. And it was around the same time we were protesting against cruelty to circus animals. Not a lot of us. I think there were at Burnley Oval in Melbourne on a cold winter's night. There was me, Linda Stoner, Peter Singer and a couple of others and a dog. Bloody animal lovers were all nut jobs, remember? I also why I supported New South Wales Premier Mike Baird's decision to ban greyhound racing from next year. And I hope that eventually that will have a domino effect and lead to a phased-in ban in all states. They had decades to clean up this corrupt, cruel sport and they didn't. They wouldn't or they couldn't. So to conclude, I haven't bored you, I want to conclude by flashing back nearly 50 years. St Patrick's Cathedral in New York, June 1968. The funeral of assassinated presidential candidate Robert Kennedy. Only five years after his brother, President John Kennedy, was assassinated in Dallas. And many of us, the mourners and, and the reporters, inside St Patrick's that morning, had been in a different smaller church, the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, only eight weeks earlier for the funeral of assassinated civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. And the mourners there had included Bobby Kennedy. And I'll always remember the words that Teddy Kennedy, the sole surviving Kennedy brother, struggled to deliver in his eulogy to Bobby at St Patrick's Cathedral. He said his brother tried to live by the words of Greek philosopher and playwright Aeschylus. Some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? Now, I heard Bobby Kennedy use that quote often on his ill-fated presidential campaign in 68, before he was assassinated in Los Angeles by Sirhan Sirhan. And those words have stayed with me for five decades and I still dream things that never were and say why not. In a country which welcomed me here as a young reporter, a callow youth, back in 1963 and accepted me as a proud Australian citizen in 1980, 36 years ago. The Australia which I dream should be and must be multicultural, with tolerance and respect for new cultures, but equally tolerance and respect for old ones. They must be honoured. The Australia which I dream should enshrine our Aboriginal history, but also acknowledge our failings, not just by white bureaucracy, which often has been cruel, sometimes well-meaning in its ignorance, but also by those Indigenous leaders who betrayed their own people and stole their money. Hypocrites like that rapist Jeff Clark, who destroyed Atsi, and there have been other Indigenous shysters as well. And after all the decades, the decades of waste, the hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars spent on Indigenous welfare and health projects and state and federal agencies and committees since Whitlam, there should not be one Aboriginal child or Torres Strait Islander without access to clean water or health care. Not one Aboriginal child with trachoma. No Aboriginal child vulnerable to sexual violence by family or neighbour while elders in remote communities cover it up. I remember several years ago opening my current affairs program on 3AW in Melbourne with a news report that two girls aged seven and nine were taken from their beds and raped in Turak last night. It didn't happen. But as I said, now I've got your attention. Because it may not have happened in Turak that night, but as sure as it'll happen in a settlement somewhere outside of Alice Springs or Darwin or Mount Isa. And so the Australia of which I dream will see perpetrators of those crimes brought to justice. Why not? 
I said the Australia which I dream should be a multicultural one, which means respect for new cultures as well as old. That's true. But that doesn't mean we embrace or make legal or turn a blind eye to brutal or demeaning or discriminating customs brought from abroad. When they breach our law, criminal charges should be laid. Why not? 30 years ago, as a reporter in Africa, I wrote about FGM, female genital mutilation. Young girls, butchered, their legs tied together and cow dung smeared on their hacked vaginas to create scabs. Now that foul custom still exists. Millions of girls have been mutilated. It happens here in Australia as well. So the wielders of the knife should be jailed. The innocent girl's parents should be prosecuted. Why not? Likewise, those who surrender their daughters as child brides should be prosecuted. As those who conducted those illegal ceremonies should be prosecuted. Why not? And the so-called husbands of these child brides should be charged with child rape. Now, Senator Hanson and I, we forced a change in child bride legislation in Victoria this month. And I hope that is a harbinger of things to come. And I will say, Sharia law must never come to Australia. It should not even be countenanced. Now, personally, I don't believe we should have separate Koori courts either. We have a legal system. It's faulty and out of touch, as it often is, that's true, but it's one system. So why not just improve it? Why not? And when things happen, like the abhorrent treatment of Indigenous child prisoners in the Northern Territory, courageously exposed by Four Corners, then rightly hold that Royal Commission and make sure that criminal charges follow where necessary. And I mentioned Sharia law, which are two words you aren't meant to use these days of political correctness, but like those other two words, Muslim terrorists. Well, in my new elected role, I will not be PC, I will speak out against Islamic terrorists, against Muslim ex extremists. I have said before I believe that ISIS is the greatest threat the world has seen since World War II. And it is a sad prediction that eventually an international force of ground troops, led by Middle Eastern countries, you hope, will be necessary to defeat the terrorists. And Australia may have to join it. But I will not support shrill scaremongers who want to ban all Muslim migrants and put CCTV cameras in all mosques and want to ban new mosques. Now, don't get me wrong. I would happily support putting court-ordered secret cameras and listening devices in a mosque or a church or a synagogue or a town hall if the security of Australia were at stake. But we didn't ostracise all Catholics when the IRA was bombing restaurants in London. So like then, we can and we should expect community leaders to condemn the cancer in their own ranks and turn them in. And if there is proof, if there is proof that halal certification, certification funds are going to support and fund international terrorism to fund ISIS, then that is a crime against the state. Track them down, prosecute and confiscate the money. Which leads me again to that old chestnut, freedom of speech. It must be preserved even when that freedom of speech repulses you and offends you, as it often repulses and offends me. In a democracy, freedom of speech must be preciously guarded. Argue against the bigots, subject them to facts and ridicule, but don't make them martyrs. They'll get elected. That's why I'm campaigning to repeal or, for starters, amend 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. You cannot say we have freedom of speech when people can be charged and convicted of a crime because they are deemed to have offended or insulted someone. Andrew Bolt, who is no friend of mine, should never have been charged, let alone convicted. Now we say, and we march. And we proudly tweet, je suis Charlie. Yeah, sure, as long as Charlie is singing from the same songbook that you are. Bugger Voltaire. And when cartoonist Bill Leake was being vilified for his cruel but accurate portrayal of a neglectful Aboriginal father, I tweeted, je suis Charlie, but banned Bill Leake. Now, even my new colleague, Senator Brands, was right when he, albeit clumsily, tried to defend a bogan's right to sound like a bogan. As I, no doubt, on occasion will have to defend the right of my other new colleague and Sunrise sparring partner, Senator Hanson, but it's called freedom of speech. And as a journalist and a commentator for 56 years, as a person who cherishes freedom of speech and who recognises and will pay tribute to the Anzacs who died to protect and preserve those precious freedoms, I am offended and insulted by any law that has emotional 
words like offend and insult enshrined in them. So I do accept and I applaud laws that say you're committing an offence if you shout fire in a crowded theatre, or as a self-styled sheikh, you publicly incite violence by targeting a racial or ethnic or religious group. They are crimes. But there are too laws of defamation and monetary compensation for genuinely aggrieved victims. Also, that leads to the cruel taunts that will be thrown at vulnerable gay people during the plebiscite debate if that ever gets off the ground, and I can tell you I will vote against it. Plebiscite sounds great. It's just a public opinion poll. And by blocking it, we can save 160 or 250 or 300 million dollars. As a Victorian senator, I hope to announce some ideas soon to create those jobs in growth that the PM keeps talking about, especially for thousands of workers in Geelong and Broadmeadows and Fisherman's Bend and who will be in dire straits after the automotive industry closes. Now, all that will, I'm sure, be aired in this program, in this chamber, I should say. <laughs> program. <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, now, look, I know this, this, this maiden speech, I call it a maiden speech, it was made in Melbourne. Uh, I know it's heavy on nostalgic anecdotes, remember when, but just want to quickly touch on something. I want to pass on a moment from my days as a police rounds reporter, and there's a point to this on the Sydney Sun, and that was more than 50 years ago. On the midnight to dawn shift, we had a big black car that looked like a cop car, and we had an illegal police radio. Now, the coppers knew we had one because if theirs broke down, they'd ask to listen to ours. And at 2 a.m. the radio would crackle and a metallic voice would say, uh, serious assault reported at Military Road Mossman. And we'd head there. And halfway there the voice would say, nah, forget it, it's just a domestic. And we'd all turn for home, just a domestic, just a drunken Mr Kelly beating the daylight out of Mrs Kelly. The cops wouldn't get involved, we wouldn't get involved, the neighbours wouldn't get involved, just a domestic, because Mr Kelly did that every Saturday night. Well, things have changed, obviously, not enough, but things have changed. Thanks to people like Rosie Batty, who joined me on my Jail to Justice walk before being named Australian of the Year. And I promise I'll do anything I can in this new position to help make domestic violence a major issue in this country. To fight against funding cuts to refuge centres. Why not? And to make government funding gender neutral, to use a, an awful expression, because men are victims of domestic violence too. But things won't change. Things will never change. They cannot change until magistrates and judges start sentencing a man who breaks his wife's jaw to as much time behind bars as a man who coward punches a total stranger, until judges get it through their blinkered brains that a wedding ring is not a mitigating circumstance. And that, that's all part of the umbrella issue which made me include as one of our major policies for the Justice Party, a call for a Senate inquiry into the family court and all child welfare agencies. And that's why I hope I can work towards building the Australian Child Protection Agency, ACPA, which will absorb all state and territory child welfare agencies down the track. Now, I know we are a commonwealth of states, but it is madness, it is naughty land, when a father can break a little boy's arm in Sydney and change states and kill that child in Adelaide because medical records in New South Wales weren't available in South Australia. That's mad. And back to the family court, there are women and men being deprived of justice in a system which is developed in a non-accountable, ultra-expensive, almost lodge-like secret organisation minus a secret handshake. Mothers and fathers are being demonised and destroyed and bankrupted through it. They are being mauled in the family court and they are often being dollared to death, as they say. Senator Hinch, uh, yes. I, I hate to interrupt the freedom of speech you are enjoying. Um, the speeches are normally 20 minutes. You've gone for 45 minutes, and I just want to remind you of the time and the courtesy that has been oh, extended to I read five more paragraphs? I'm sure you can finish in five I more paragraphs. I apologise. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, I'll move over on the, on the justice there. I talked about do the crime, do the crime. Okay, I'll wrap it up. Now, as I said, I may be the oldest person ever elected to the Senate. I still have fire in my belly. I still have the passion, maybe the power to do something about it, and I give it my all. So let me just say to you here, I was once asked by a journalist, for one of those silly colour magazine feature pieces, what inscription would you want on your tombstone? And I thought and I said, just two words, he tried. So that'll do me when I leave this chamber and I leave this world. He tried. Or, as I would have said all those years ago on television, I'm Darren Hinch, that's life. Good night.
Senator McDonald finished, I think. Okay.